but it's so good to be here this morning. And so why don't we pray before we begin properly? Yeah, Father God, we thank you that you are that, that you are Father to your children. That you identify us, even this morning, as your sons and daughters. That you thought of each of us when you brought Jesus into the world. And Jesus, we thank you this morning for coming into the world. for coming down from your throne to a stable, revealing to us who the Father really is. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are still alive today. You are still alive and powerful. You are on the right-hand side of the Father. And we thank you that by your Holy Spirit you are here with us all right now. And if it's a arm round a shoulder kind of morning, if it's a whisper in the ear kind of morning, would you come, Holy Spirit? Would you come and comfort us? Come and speak to us? Would you come and mold us? Come and shape us into who you have called and created us to be? We thank you for your presence here in this place. And we ask for more more of you to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we will be looking at Psalm 46. So if you'd like to get that open, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, but whatever version you've got is fine. So Psalm 46 from verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Amen. And so, to begin, Psalm 46 is a psalm of confidence. It is a psalm of boldness. It is a psalm of declaration. It is a psalm of declaring that God is who he says he is. Verse 1, God is our refuge, not a refuge. It's so easy to almost see people as a refuge, a physical place as a refuge, but in this verse, God is saying he's the refuge. When you Google refuge, synonyms like shelter, protection, safety, and sanctuary all come up. Biblically speaking, it is a place or that place that would provide shelter or protection. So God is our shelter. God is our protection. God and his presence will shelter you. He will and does, even now, even in this moment, offer protection for you. 
God is always ready to help. It's so easy to look at certain people that may have helped us in the past and be like, oh, but he'll only help occasionally. He'll only help every now and again. But God is always ready to help. God is always wanting to help. God never wanted us to do this life on our own. And that is why he sent Jesus. God is continually present, omnipresent, which is defined as being present everywhere at the same time. So in simple terms, he's with each of us individually, right here, right now. Henry Nguyen, the Catholic priest, says, God is a God of the present. God is always in the moment. Be that moment hard or easy, joyful or painful. The challenge is to invite him in. Invite him into us, yes, on a daily basis, of course, but also every moment of every day. It's so easy to go through a day. I've been working at a campsite recently, and it's so easy to go through the day without even looking once and being like, oh, God, you're still there, cool. It's so easy to get busy. It's so easy to get distracted. And if anything, I think COVID has really amplified that. We've been, able, we've been distracted by Zoom. We've been distracted by the chaos that has been going on. When actually God, maybe he was just simply whispering, do you want me? Will you invite me today? I love the way in which the Passion Translation says the first verse. It says, you are a proven help in time of trouble. More than enough and always available whenever I need you. God is more than enough. He is always available whenever we need him. He doesn't go to bed at half past ten at night and wake up at seven. He is around all the time for us to speak to him. After declaring these wonderful truths and statements of who God is, the psalmist clearly writes of the most frightening phenomenon of imaginable. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. I, in June, went on holiday to Cornwall and there were a couple of, I wouldn't say mountains, but hills, and it was by the sea. And to even picture those crumbling would be quite a stressful, just, just scary sight, really. But it is after the psalmist writes about God being our refuge and strength that he comes up with this phenomenon. And because of the first verse, it calls us to faith and not fear. It calls us to triumph over timidity. God is greater. So I don't know what your worst case scenario is. I don't know whether you're even living a worst case scenario right now. But I want to declare over them that God is greater. God is greater than any problem. God is greater than any trouble that we may face. God is there to help you, walk alongside you, empower you, and equip you to keep going. However, isn't it interesting that this COVID season, in I don't know about you, but in the Christian circles that I've been part of, I don't know whether it's cookies on Facebook or what, but every single one seems to be saying COVID is like an earthquake. There has been a shaking that people were not expecting. COVID has been a shaking. It's been a waking up. I don't know what that looks like for you individually or you as a family, but whatever has happened, there has been a shaking of what was normal. Like who thought 18 months ago we'd all be wearing masks still? Who'd have thought social distancing and the rule of six were even words in our vocabulary? And yet somehow God has allowed it to happen. So I don't know about you, but it makes my mind wonder, what is God wanting to do in this time? What is God saying through COVID? Maybe it's a wake up. Maybe it's a realization that we can't do stuff on our own anymore. Maybe it's a realization that the politics of our country just, they don't have supreme reign. God has supreme reign. 
And so now we come to an interlude. We come to a cellar, a pause in his presence. And I think it's so easy for on a Sunday just to speed through a sermon, leave a church building, and then forget it all come Monday morning. It's so easy to get it over and done with, to go in haste. But I think it's really important that we recognize for recognition within this and many Psalms to pause and to ponder. So I'm just going to breathe in and out three times. You may want to join me. But just to reflect on those first verses that we've read, that God is our refuge, he is our strength, that even in the most frightening scenario, he will be there and he is greater. So I'm just going to breathe in and out three times. Okay, in verse 4, we read of a river, a river that brings joy to the city of our God. This verse is actually a prophetic statement. The city being spoken about is Jerusalem, and at the time of writing, Jerusalem didn't have a river. If anything, it had small pockets of water. And yet, as Christians, we are called into being what we have not seen yet. We are called to pray and declare those rivers in those dry, dead places. The psalmist is speaking of a future reality. In Revelation 22, verse 1, we read of, of a river flowing through the temple itself in the New Jerusalem. This is the river he's referring to. What do we need to call into being? What is the future reality that we want to see? Obviously, we want to see a COVID-free world. We want to see a COVID-free country. But surely after COVID, we can't go back to normal. I just, I struggle with the wording of that in itself, to go back to normal, going backwards. It just, does it feel just odd to me, or is it odd to you too, that we're to go back when this is all over? What if we're to go forward? And what if God is saying to you personally, what if God is saying to Hayward Seed Baptist Church, let's go forward, let's come back different. Let's come back full of life. Let's come back different from what we were before. Let's come back with the joy, the joy that God gives us. Let's go back with a dependency that we didn't have before. I don't know how dependent you are on God, but maybe COVID has meant you are more dependent on him. But I always feel he's whispering, and this is a challenge for me too, but I feel he's whispering, oh, there's more. There is always more. Between 1949 and 1952, there was a great revival that began in the Hebridean islands of Scotland. Its impact is still felt worldwide and you can't ignore some of the stuff that came out of it. Duncan Campbell, the man who God worked through to bring that revival, wrote to the associates that he had in another part of Scotland as part of an update. I think it had only been something like three weeks into the revival. And he just simply said, the deserts are rejoicing again. The deserts are rejoicing again. I just love that picture. And it just excites and stirs something that the deserts can rejoice again. Where we look at things, where we may look at Hayward's Heath and think, this place is dry. This place is dead. God is saying, no. <laughs> I'm wanting to bring new life to this place. New water to this place. And it starts in us. We can so easily, as people, have those dry places in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. We can have those deserts. But what if they were to rejoice again? 
What if that dry part of your heart, that part that you have closed off to that family member, that friend that you haven't been in touch with for years, what if the Holy Spirit was to pour his water on that and it was to rejoice again? It's a challenge for all of us. And in, back in May time, I spoke about how easy it is to have a stony, stubborn heart. And it's just so hard. But we can't make it soft. It's only the love of God that will soften it. And we have to position ourselves for that love to pour into those hard places. About a week ago, my mum got married. And, wow, what words are there to say? Just, it's a thing that you never think you'll go to. And I want to remain respectful because I did go because I wanted to love and support her. But it's hard. It's difficult to have that tender and responsive heart that God wants us to have for those people. To be able to look at my mum's new and now husband with a tender and responsive heart. It's hard. It's a choice. And there are days where it's impossible. There are days where I feel like I can't look at this guy with love. But it's when I remind myself of the love that God has for me that I remember it's the same love that he has for this guy, for my mum. And though it's not what my mum, what any of us would have wanted, it was ultimately a great sadness that she was getting married. God will work through it. And he works all things together for the good of those who love him. And I don't know whether you're in a situation where it's just so easy to put on autopilot and have that stony, stubborn heart, even without you realizing that sometimes things will happen and you'll realize, oh, why did I react like that? Why did I respond like that? And maybe the Holy Spirit is wanting to pour his water onto it. Like the deserts Duncan Campbell was talking about, maybe we as the people of God would rejoice again. Those people that are prone to fail, those people that are prone to not be successful. And yet in our weakness we say, Holy Spirit, would you come and make me who you have called and created me to be? His living water is wanting to pour in and through you. In you, so it transforms you, but also through you, so it transforms those around you. In verse 6, we read, The nations are in chaos, and their kingdoms crumble. The nations, in the Old Testament, refers to the Gentiles. In Psalm 2, verses 1 to 2, we understand a bit more about who the Gentiles are, the character and the insight into the Gentiles. And it says, why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The king, uh, kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. In essence, the Gentiles refuse to acknowledge the Lord. They choose not to surrender to him. That is why they are in chaos. That is why their kingdoms are crumbling. The Lord is sovereign, meaning God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. And yet, I feel the psalm is just a psalm of and yet and yet he chooses to be among his people he wants to know you really get to know you it's by getting to know him and surrendering all to him that we can recognize God to be our fortress our place of safety which is written in verse 7 of this psalm. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. 
the God of Israel is our fortress. And so now we come to another interlude. So I'm just going to invite you to breathe in and out again three times to really think and ponder on what God is saying individually to you through this psalm. In verse 8, we are invited to see the glorious works of the Lord. In John 15, in John 5, sorry, verse 17, Jesus reveals to us a great truth about God. My Father is always working. That verse has not changed. History has not changed that statement. My Father is always working working it was back in February I try and do a bit of journaling with God where I try and listen to what he's saying and I simply felt him say one day heaven is busy heaven is at work the kingdom of heaven is coming and is here in part but are we open to it in its fullness we have to position ourselves humbly and appropriately to recognize this. In the second part of verse 8, it says about God bringing destruction upon the world. However, God will only bring destruction and judgment to establish his peace, his reign, his rule. It's not a I hate you. It's a I want you. Verse 10, the verse that we all probably know off by heart, the verse that we've probably all got a fridge magnet of, the verse we've probably all got a key ring of somewhere. I know in my room I've got it at least five times in two magnets and three key rings. So it just says, be still and know that I am God. In this moment, the author of the psalm changes to God himself. Be still and know that I am God. However, did you know that the, thra- the phrase be still in the original Hebrew is actually translated to let go? Let go and know that I am God. I remember when I found this out and it completely blew my mind and it meant I looked at the psalm in a completely different way. Let go and know that I am God. This is a really powerful statement. This is a powerful statement to read at the best of times, but also very powerful within the context of the psalm we've been reading. We have read of the God who is our refuge, the God who is always present, always ready to help, the protector God, the sovereign God, the one who has supreme authority, the one who is Lord, the one who is master of heaven's armies, is inviting us to let go and know that he is God. And we've read so many powerful, wonderful truths about who this God is in this psalm. And now he's saying, let go. Let go of everything that distracts you from knowing that I am God. Let go of that person that annoys you, quite frankly. Let go of that group of people that frustrate you. Let go of those judgments that you have had. Let go of those feelings and inappropriate emotions you have felt towards maybe that one family member, maybe towards that situation or experience. But in this singular verse, we are called to let go, to release, to surrender and know that God is God. And this challenged me when I read it because... In the preparation, it was literally two days after mum's wedding. And it was just, let, let go and know that I am God. And it's so much easier said than done. Letting go is not just a simple unclenching of the fist. It's a daily choice. 
and it comes with time and patience. And it's only by the grace of God that we can do it in the first place. We are not strong enough to do it on our own, and God never wanted us to do it on our own. As we heard and listened in the Father's love letters, he is the one that is wanting to draw close to us. He is the God that is putting his arm around your shoulder and saying, let go. I want you to let go. And he's patient enough that if we don't want to, he'll be, okay, we'll try again tomorrow. So what do you need to let go of this morning? What do you need to let go of today? What do you need to let go of the week that's just passed? We are called to a light burden, an easy yoke. So would we as a people, as the church of Hayworthy Baptist Church, know that it is the God that draws close to us, the God that embraces us and just says, let go. And it's only in his strength that we can do this. The second part of this verse, I will be honoured by every nation. I will be honoured throughout the world. Isn't that a wonderful heart cry? That we would pray that that would happen. That God would be honoured by every nation. And honoured throughout the world. How far we have gone. How far... We have run from him when all he's wanted is us to run towards him. I was struck by the prodigal son story a couple of months ago, how the son is looking down at the dirt on his feet, and it's only when he looks up that he sees the father running towards him. And I think it's similar to us. We can look down at the dirt that we have done, the sin that we have committed, the mistakes we have made, when God is saying, just look up. Look up and you will see me running, running to you. And so there will be a day where the second part of this verse will come to pass, where it will happen. Whereas Philippians 2 verses 10 and 11 says, For at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Pope Francis says, let's return to our first love in order to receive the fire which Jesus has kindled in the world and to bring that fire to all people to the very ends of the earth. The psalm ends with a perfect parallel to verse 7. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. The Lord of heaven's armies is among you. Right here, right now. So just going to do the final interlude. And then just a few points to conclude and then we'll pray. So, to conclude, God is our refuge. God is your refuge. God is present with you. He will be present with you now, when you go home, when you wake up tomorrow morning, and the next morning, and the next morning, and the next morning. And he challenges us to reveal himself to the world. That as we grow so much more aware of his presence, we will grow so much more aware of his love for the world, for his world, for Haywards Heath, for Haywards Heath Baptist Church. God is wanting us to recognize more of his presence. He is in everything. 
God is wanting full acknowledgement and surrender. Maybe you need to pray that this morning. I acknowledge you again. I am weak, but I choose to acknowledge you again, as you have acknowledged me. God is our fortress. God is always working. God is wanting you to let go, to let go and know that he is who he says he is. Shall we pray? Yeah, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. And because of who you are, who we are. Your treasured possession. Your masterpieces. Your chosen people. And we ask that you would come, Holy Spirit, and transform us more and more into the likeness of Jesus fully dependent on our Father. And if we need to let go of any feelings or emotions, any situations or circumstances, we recognize that we can let go in confidence and in boldness, knowing that you are for us and not against us. You are not far away. You never leave or forsake your children. And so would we recognize, Father God, your loving arm around each of our shoulders into this week. The God who says, let go. The God who says, look at me and smile. And you will see that I am looking at you and smiling. And so would you continue to speak to us, not just today, but every day this week, that we might become a people that are more aware of your presence in the everyday, in the ordinary moments of our lives, knowing that you make the ordinary extraordinary. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're just going to do our last song, which is a great Tim Yu song. And it might be that you don't even want to sing to this song. It might be that you want to respond in your heart to what has been shared this morning. And my biggest prayer is that this talk would not be remembered for the fact that I came and spoke, but it would be remembered because God shared his heart. God was sharing what he wanted to say and what heaven is up to. And so however you want to respond to this song, if you want to sing, if you want to stand, if you want to sit, if you want to kneel, would you be so aware of the Lord's presence with you right here, right now?